Now foundation scripture will be Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It reads like this. God eagerly pursues us, and this is even in the Old Testament. As we read, God says we're already healed. That applies to everybody. For God bought you with a high price. You must honor God with your body. Hi, I'm Linda Gardner from Intoxicating Love Ministries. I want to welcome you to this program, and I'm going to share with you some of the experiences that I had on a mission trip to Belize um, two weeks ago that were phenomenal. So I'm going to give you a little flavor of that today and probably be talking about that over the next few sessions just because it was such an amazing trip. So I'm going to open up us with prayer. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We need you. We love you. We know that you are the inspiration for everything that happens on this earth. So we open our minds to you. We open our hearts to you. We open our eyes to you and we open our ears to you. Speak through me as I speak today and open people's minds and their hearts to receive that they might be everything that you have desired for them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was in Belize, one of the favorite songs that we like to sing with the kids is My God is So Big. So I'm going to sing a little bit of that for you just because it's a lot of fun and there's pur purpose in me singing that. So the song goes, My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Now the kids love singing that song and I can imagine why because when you're a kid to think that God is so big and that there's nothing that he can do and that he is strong and that he is mighty and that he created everything, that gives you hope. So what happens when we become an adult that we stop believing that? Do we still believe that my God is so big that he's strong, he's mighty, and there's nothing that he cannot do? Or did somewhere along the road did we lose our hope? So let's turn to Mark 10, 15. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So that is a verse that we all know quite well. It's usually brought up more than once somewhere along our journey. And this is just telling us how important it is to have that faith, that heart of a child, that glimmer in your eye of hope and of, of uh, knowing that God is amazing. So uh, children have believed these things and they, they haven't been tainted yet to have unbelief. I believe that many babies see angels, and I think we've all experienced that, where they'll, you'll be looking at them and they look somewhere past you and they're smiling and they're giggling. And I know my little grandson will wave to them and he'll even talk to them. And it, it amazes me. I'll even ask them, I'll say, Chase, where are your angels? And he points up and he laughs and giggles. And I wonder where in, in our lifespan does that go away? When do we lose that ability to see into the spiritual realm? So uh, I would encourage you that if you are around children, uh, encourage that behavior to continue. You know, encourage them to keep looking for their angels and to keep a, a positive attitude about the, the awesomeness of God. God gave us authority to rule the earth. So let's find out in the Bible where he does that. Let's turn to Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So God gave us the ability to have authority over everything on this earth. And when God gives us authority, he, is, he does not turn back on his word. So he said, you are going to rule the earth, and he gave us the authority to do so. And he won't take that authority back. So we need to understand what is our authority, how are we to rule the earth, and what are we supposed to do. So let's uh, turn to, Jesus is our example of that. He uh, came to, to this earth as a man, not with his godly powers. 
he relied totally on God. And we know that from looking at Philippians 2, 5 through 8. So let's turn to that. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So here this is telling us that Jesus gave up his divine privileges. He wanted to show us that how could we operate as a human being looking to God for guidance. And this is confirmed in John 5, 19 through 20. So let's turn to that. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees his Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does also. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. So this is showing that Jesus did not do anything on his own. He only did what he saw the Father doing. So it's really important that we understand who God is and what he wants us to do to be able to, to do the things that we see him doing. And Jesus gave his authority to his disciples. First he started out with the 12 disciples. Let's uh, go to Matthew 10.1 to see that. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. So Jesus did these things first himself. He taught by example, and then he commissioned his disciples to do the same. And it says here that they had the ability to cast out every disease and illness. And if you read throughout the New Gospels, there are multiple healings, and it, it always says that Jesus healed all that were sick, all that were diseased, and so did his disciples. So we need to remember that the bar is, is up there. We don't want to lower it. We tend to lower our expectations to meet what we expect and not what God desires. Uh, he did send out more disciples with authority as well, and we can find that in Luke 10, first verse 1, and then we're going to skip down to verses 17 through 19. So Luke 10, 1, the Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. And then I'm going to skip down to verses 17 through 19. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. So here Jesus is telling us how we can have victory over Satan, that he, can, he saw him fall from heaven like lightning. So when we obey the command that Jesus gave us to cast out the demons, to heal the sick, to cleanse the leper, and to raise the dead, that's when Satan is defeated and that's when he is crushed. So he's telling us here how to do that. And we are, it's, it's, it talks about disciples, and we are disciples. That just means a follower of Jesus. So if you are a follower of Jesus, this is what you are commanded to do, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the leper, and to cast out demons. And there's a speaker that I love to listen to. His name is Bill Johnson. He's in Bethel Church. I know I've mentioned that before in Redding, California. And he'll have people come up to him all the time, and he'll, they'll ask him, you know, what should I do in my life? Where, what should I, which path should I take? So, like, for example, someone will say, should I get married or should I stay single? So Bill will tell them, well, choose one, and then heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and cast out demons. So someone else asks, should I be a lawyer or should I be a teacher? And he says, well, pick one, and then heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and cast out demons. So it's pretty simple what our, our responsibilities are on this earth. 
And I know that, especially in this country, we just don't have the faith for that. We don't believe that, that we have the authority to do it. And in fact, I believe that some people don't even think that God has the desire or the ability to do these things. And so we've limited ourselves on what type of miracles we're able to see. Uh, the, the Bible also tells us that signs and wonders will follow when the gospel is preached. So we should expect that when the gospel is preached that these signs and wonders will show up to confirm that they are true. And again, I think we try to water down what the gospel is and instead of presenting it with power and the signs and wonders following, we tend to accept a lesser message. So let's turn to Acts 14, verse 3 and see what it says about signs and wonders. Okay, but the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord, and the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. So this is a perfect example of when you speak the gospel that signs and wonders will follow. Another example of this can be found in Mark 16, verses 15 through 18. And then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. So if you believe, this is what you'll see. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. So the Bible is telling us that if we are believers, we should be able to do these things. And I know, again, in our culture, we have tended to not take the Bible as being, um, that we take every word as being truthful. We tend to pick and choose what we want to. And that's not what it says. We, we either take the whole thing or nothing at all. And what's interesting is there were some missionaries that went to China and they were there just before the borders were closed. So they had brought a bunch of Bibles over and they basically just left the Bibles there and left because the borders were closing. So they had advised for all missionaries to leave the country. Well, of course, they were closed for a number of years. And many years after that, when the borders opened, some people went back to the same group and wanted to know how they were doing. And they were healing the sick. They were raising the dead. They were casting out demons and cleansing lepers. And the missionaries were amazed, and they said, how did you learn to do these things? And they answered, well, you left us these books, and it said that we could, so we did. And the sad part of it is, my guess is if the missionaries would have stayed, they probably would not have done all of these things. But because they didn't know any different, they took the word as being truthful, and they followed it, and they were seeing those results. So another um, example to look at as far as faith goes is we know in the New Testament that Jesus was not able to heal very many people in Nazareth where he grew up because they, had, they didn't have faith. At first they were amazed at the way that he spoke because he spoke in a way that, was, that this truth was coming forth and it spoke to their heart. But then they started thinking in their minds, they started intellectualizing it, and they said, hmm, isn't this Jesus, isn't this Joseph's son, the carpenter? you know, they started to question who he was. And they say that prophets are never uh, totally, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, recognized wherever they are, are from because people just think of them as a common person that, don't, that isn't able to do the things that they are doing. So they did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They did not believe that he had the ability to heal people. So no, very few people were healed. But when he started to go out into other areas, people would come from miles and miles to be healed because they heard of all the miracles of all the people that he healed. So there, there's a perfect example that you are, uh, are healed according to your faith. In fact, Jesus said that many times to people, you have been healed because of your faith. So that is the number one ingredient that we need in order to receive a healing. 
Uh, another thing that we need to have is the person that's praying for the healing needs to believe. Well, of course, Jesus believed that because he was in perfect union with the Father and he knew the power of God. So when he prayed, he believed that a person would be healed. In fact, I would assume that he would be shocked if someone was not. And I would think that if they were not, it was beyond, because they did not believe. In fact, I would guarantee that. It wasn't because Jesus did not believe. And the third thing that can cause uh, healing not to take place is that sometimes there is demonic influence that is not willing to let go. And I think about the paralytic that the disciples prayed over, um, the, the, the son that was having epileptic seizures, excuse me, not the paralytic, but a son that was having epileptic seizures, and they were not able to, to heal the boy. And my guess is what happened is the boys probably started a seizure and the disciples freaked out because they had seen healings before so they knew that God was able to heal and that he could heal. But I think they probably saw that the boy was seizuring and getting worse so they lost their faith. And they asked Jesus, Jesus came and Jesus healed the boy and they asked Jesus how, why didn't it work for us when we prayed for him? And he said this type requires prayer and fasting and what he meant was this type of unbelief. So when we have unbelief, the best thing that we can do is to pray and to fast. And fasting is a way of denying the flesh because that is our greatest uh, instinct is to, to eat, to survive. So if we deny the flesh and we, we tell it that you're okay, you're not going to die just because I'm not eating for a few days, we can, the spiritual part of our, our, our body, soul, and mind can take over and tell our body that you are going to submit to me. And that's what we should do. Our spirit is connected to God's spirit. And when we become a new creation in Christ, that's who we are. It's our new spirit. And we have to teach our soul and our flesh how to be submissive to the spirit. So that's one way of doing it. And you don't do it to be religious or to brag to other people that I'm fasting. In fact, the Bible says that we should do that without letting everybody know. In fact, we should, if we go to work that day, we should be energetic, we should be joyful. People should not know that we are sacrificing food that day, but instead it should be something private between us and God and allow us to focus on God. And I know when I fast, that's what I do. As I start to feel hunger pains, it just reminds me to stay connected with God. And it's a good way to do that because when you don't eat for the day, you feel them quite frequently and you know that you're connecting with God on a regular basis. So if you want to get breakthrough in a certain area that you're looking for a direction in or guidance in, fasting is a great way to do that. Or if you're praying on somebody else's behalf, it's a reminder for you to pray. And sometimes people have spiritual experiences in, while they're fasting. Sometimes you won't, but I can assure you that by taking control over the flesh, you will have positive results, if not immediately, down the road for focusing on your relationship with God. Um, I didn't always believe that healings were possible either. In fact, I would watch some of the people on TV and I would laugh and I would think that it was just a put on and that people were just uh, you know, positive thinking that they thought they were healed and they really weren't. I'm ashamed to say that, but that is what I believed. And if that's what you believe, you will never open the door to anything other than that. Well, then I became part of a, a group that we were planning a Saturday night service at our church. And frankly, that service never really took off. Um, there really wasn't a whole lot of commitment there. But the, the fellowship that we shared in that little group will, ha, has changed my life. We started praying for each other for healing, and we really didn't know a whole lot about it. We didn't, we didn't really read the scriptures about it, but we believed that God would heal. And we saw some miraculous things. One of the ladies had spots on her liver. We prayed over her, and the next time she went in, the spots were completely gone. And as you might suspect, usually spots mean cancer, so it was kind of unusual that they were there, and all of a sudden they were gone. So that was exciting. Then we prayed for the same lady another time because she was having problems with her lymph nodes being uh, inflamed all the time, and she had this issue for several years, and we prayed over her, and they disappeared as well. So that was even more exciting. When you start getting results, it builds your faith. There was another lady that was having uh, trouble with pregnancy and they told her she had to be on bed rest for the rest of her pregnancy and her doctor said that she would do cartwheels if she was able to get to six months. And she, we prayed over her and she went full term. And the second time she was pregnant, we prayed over her. Her cervix was too short and that's why she had to have, be on bed rest for the first one. 
Well, the second time we prayed for her, her cervix actually grew, which is medically impossible, and she was able to not have any bed rest at all and delivered full term on that one as well. Well, finally, the third example I have is I, my cousin had a heart and a kidney transplant, and we, uh, he was not doing very well. His, he was in a drug-induced coma because his lungs were not responding well, and frankly, UW Hospital in Madison did not know, know what to do with him, so they put him in a drug-induced coma. And I felt like I was supposed to say to his wife, which was my cousin's wife, that uh, we would pray over him if it was okay with her because I had seen all these other miracles of healings and I thought, well, if they could do that, if God could do that for them, he could certainly do it for my cousin. And at first, my cousin's wife was not responsive. She thought probably that we were a little weird, just like I thought of people before I started to see it firsthand. And so she didn't want it. But then it got to a point where she was desperate because she couldn't stand seeing him in this drug-induced coma. They kept him in that coma for 30 days. So she said, come on up and pray over him, which we did. And he did not miraculously jump out of bed at that instant, but things started to change for him at that time. Now, he was in the ICU and the nursing home for a total of nine months, but he did recover completely, and he was released. Well, he went back to the ICU to visit them, and they said to him, you are a miracle. We had given up on you. We didn't know what to do for you. And then when your cousin and her friends came up to pray over you, that's when we saw a change. So how exciting to see the specialist at a, a major hospital in the United States say that it was a miracle. That is to the glory of God. So once you've experienced these things, just have a faith for a little something and press in for it. When you start seeing the results, it'll get you excited and you'll, want, you'll expect more and you'll realize that God is an awesome God and he does want to heal us. Another example is Heidi and Roland Baker. They have a ministry in Mozambique, and they uh, um, wanted to pick the country that was the poorest country in the poorest continent of the world. And they go there, and they go to a village that is primarily Muslim, and they say, Jesus will heal all of your sick. He will heal all of your lame. He will make the deaf hear, and he will make the blind see. And they come, and all of the people are healed. And they watch a film about Jesus. And once you've all been healed of whatever you have, they don't have access to medical care. They are so excited to accept Jesus as their Savior, the whole village becomes Christians. And this has been going on for a number of years in Mozambique. They have 6,000 churches now, and they're not traditional churches like you would expect in this country, but they are communities. And they believe in Jesus Christ, and they have seen the power of God. And once you've seen it, you can't deny who he is. Uh, there were many healings when I was in Belize. I was there for a week, and it was so exciting to pray for people because they have the faith to believe. And again, they don't have access to the medical care that we do. It is better than most third world countries, and if they can save some money, they are able to sometimes send somebody to the doctor for additional care. But it is very costly for them, and it means a sacrifice. They probably have to give up something that would be a basic need for us in order to do so. So they are so receptive to prayer. So I asked if anybody wanted prayer. And I saw probably a good 10 healings that week for sure. Uh, backs, shoulders, accidents that people were in that had damage to their wrist. Or, and I saw them healed. It was very exciting. And there were some that were believing that they were healed that was not something that was visible. For example, diabetes or other issues that couldn't be measured immediately. But they had the faith to believe for it. And it was very exciting to see the, the people responding to the goodness of God and receiving their healing. Um, I want you to turn to John 14, 10 through 14, please. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So here Jesus is telling us that we can ask for anything and he will do it. Why? To glorify his Father. Well, obviously it has to be something that's within the Father's will. 
Well, is it the Father's will to heal people? Yes, absolutely. There is no sickness in heaven, no disease. There was no sickness in, in the Garden of Eden and no disease. So we know that it's God's will. We might not always understand why someone is not healed, but that's not for us to determine. We are to believe that, that they are to be healed, and we are to try to help them believe that as well and to press in for that healing. Uh, sometimes it's hard, though, to hear the voice of God. We get distracted, we get busy. But it's really important that we do take the time to pray, to fast, and to, to, be, to pray on behalf of somebody to help them receive their healing. Uh, let's turn to Romans 8, 19 through 22. And this is one of my favorite verses. It says, For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in the glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So this is telling us that the world is looking for the sons of God or the children of God, that's us, to step up and to, sh to give them hope. So we should take that challenge seriously and we should know that God is going, if we just take a little bit of faith and move forward, it says we only need a mustard seed of faith and move forward, that we can be instruments for God and we can give the world the hope that they're looking for. And it seems that times have gotten more challenging. It seems that darkness is taking over. But no, we carry the light. And my prayer for everyone is that you will now be encouraged to just step out in faith, pray for that first person for healing, and know that God wants to be glorified and he will honor your, wherever you are in your journey. And my prayer is that you will have a desire to be an instrument for God, to be wanting to, to heal people by Jesus Christ working through you, and that you will dig into the scriptures, you will see that Jesus healed all of the sick, and you will start having the faith to believe that he wants to do that today. So Father God, thank you for the people that have tuned in today. This is not uh, a coincidence that you turned in today, that you tuned in. God wants to use you as an instrument. So dig into the Bible, look for your destiny, have faith that God is a healer, that he loves his people, he wants them whole, and be the person, be that liaison for the person that doesn't believe. Trust that God wants to use you, that he has given you the same authority that he gave Jesus when Jesus was on the earth. We don't carry a little Holy Spirit in us, but the most powerful God Almighty. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited about what God wants to tell you and wants to share with you. So I hope you will join me on the next program. You can reach me at Intoxicating Love Ministries, P.O. Box 525, McFarland, Wisconsin, 53558. We will see you next time.